welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. I'm so glad this week to finally have on Paul Rossi. Uh, Paul and I have, have uh, had a lot of these kinds of conversations over drinks and bars in New York City um, at, or, or at, at dissident gatherings, um, and of course, mocking us here a little bit. <laughs> but Yeah, but, good times. Uh, we've had all these, these conversations, and I'm really pleased to be able to bring them to uh, my audience here. Because um, I think they're always really interesting. Um, so Paul Rossi is um, he's an advisor to uh, Education Liberty Alliance, um, and he's also uh, half of I believe a duo that um, had a podcast, Chalkboard Heresy. So fundamentally, Paul is a teacher. Um, he he was a teacher uh, at least uh, at at a very Tony private school in New York before um, he challenged the woke orthodoxy there, and then consequently got himself both, you know, sort of pushed out and widely canceled. Um, at the same time, he wrote this tour de force letter that went out in Common Sense, Barry Weiss's Substack, um, that was just a really powerful declaration of, I think, a teacher's role um, and, and responsibilities to uh, his students and, and responsibilities to the truth. Um, and so I really highly recommend if you haven't read that, that was um, a while back, but it's well worth rereading. Um, so welcome, Paul, to, to High Noon. Thanks for having me on, Inez. It's great to, great to be here. So let's let's start uh, with, with uh, to use, I, 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 hate, I hate the word woke and I hate the word canceled because I feel like they're so kind of vague and, and trendy and um, don't really communicate something sharp, but I have struggled to come up with better words. So uh, leaving that aside, um, Let's let's talk through what happened um, when you were a teacher. I think it was called Grace Grace Church School. Is that is that right? That's the name of the place. Yeah, yeah. Grace um, Church. I had, I had taught there for twelve ten years, um, approximately, and um, I started with the with the high school. They opened a new high school, and they're they're a long. They're, they have a storied tradition, at on the um, you know the east side downtown Manhattan. Um, they've been around since for over a hundred years and, uh, they opened a high school really marketed and geared towards, uh, the colleges, uh, in terms of like, they had a progressive angle from the beginning, um, and they continue to have one. Um, it's a smart move because that's what colleges want. They wanted students, um, who are sort of woke weaned is how I put it again, with all the caveats around that word woke, um, but essentially progressive, social justice uh, ideology informed with all the attendant uh, things like gender ideology, critical race theory informed attached to it. And they started going that way from the beginning um, with increasing pressure and power uh, as the years went on. Uh, so I started to, at first I was a, I was gung-ho. I mean, I wasn't like super gung-ho, but I was, I was, okay with it. And I thought it was generally good. And then as, as the years went by, I started to notice an effect on the students, which, uh, was not healthy. It's effect on the debate within the school and the way certain beliefs were being presented as, as knowledge, when in fact they were not knowledge, they are a particular theory, theoretical lens. Uh, and, and the most painful part that of that changed my mind was watching the students struggle with it, watching them try to uh, handle a cognitive dissonance that comes around to being, having no ability to articulate um, or pr pressure not to articulate doubt uh, when it's being pushed so hard. And, and Grace is not unique in that regard. It's actually something that we've been seeing over and over in the past year uh, a few before my article came out, but many, many, many instances after that, uh, schools like Brearley, schools like Collegiate, schools like uh, Horace Mann, these are the the uh, top Tony private schools in the New York area. And the same thing out west. You've got Harvard Westlake. Um, you, in Chicago, you have Chicago Latin. And these schools are all under the umbrella of a, of a association called the National Association of Independent Schools. We can talk a little bit about them. Uh, but this is, this is a, uh, a trend long in the making. So when I started, you know, the upshot of my article uh, was that I no longer work at Grace Church School. Um, 
and we can go into details on that. But essentially, since then, I really did a deep dive into NAIS, the National Association of Independent Schools, the conferences they hold, the professional relationships, the hiring practices, their principles of equity and justice, and how they really inform this, this sea change among all of these schools. Why, why do you think it is that our elite have been so wholly captured by these ideas? Because if, if, if you pull some of this, you know, um, the underlying principles of critical race theory, systemic racism, uh, you know, implicit bias, uh, some of these, these topics, or it, certainly if you pull some of the gender ideology, it seems like there's a strong majority of Americans who are deeply skeptical uh, of these ideas, at least in their most extreme forms. Um, but that poll that's about, you know, a lot of these issues are even 80, 20, but it seems like among our elite, it flips to, tw to the opposite direction, right? Like 20, 80. Um, and I, I wonder if you, given that you worked in, in one of these essentially elite pipeline schools that, you know, a lot of your students went on to, to go to, you know, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, right? Um, and, and then from those universities, elite universities into places of, of real, prestige and power in our in our country, right? Um, whether that's being, you know, in the halls of the New York Times or whether that's in the halls of the DOJ, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or frankly, uh, as VPs and CEOs of, of um, most of America's major corporations. So mm -hmm. why do you think it's been the elite that has been so easily sort of captured and dedicated to these ideas? It's a great question, and there's a there are two explanations that I find compelling. That both of them are, pro I think, are going on. There's this sort of numinous spiritual explanation, uh, which I would point listeners to who haven't read it to to White Guilt by Shelby Steele, um, and and the way that book articulates the the vaporization of the moral authority of institutions, particularly academic institutions. Um, elite institutions after the civil rights movement, this feeling that, you know, the very elite moral authority that these places held and it trans and it, and it, you know, including objective truth, including, you know, righteousness and, and self, you know, belief in the self all the way. It's a psychological vacuum really. And so the spiritual quality of, professing ones, um, you know, replacing, substituting essentially this void with this airsats morality of social justice, this mania around social justice. It's these, these ideas, implicit bias, critical rate, they're not being evaluated um, based on the facts. They're being evaluated for the psychological value they hold for the institutions. It's a way for them to recapture moral authority uh, in a very condescending, I, I believe, and, and de degrading way to the very populations that they're seeking to help. Um, the other explanation is one which is, I think, a kind of in the inverse in that it's, it's, a, it's a way for wealthy elites to simultaneously mask their privilege and um, blame everyone else for it. So what do I mean by that? So it's, you know, it's, it's a point that's been made elsewhere, right? So I'm, you know, it's not that I'm, I have tremendous resources that I'm in the 0.0101% as people who ran my school were, you know, these are people that had enormous legacy wealth. You know, the, the current head of school is a direct descendant of JP Morgan. I mean, we're talking about big, big, big old money here. Um, it's not that we're super wealthy. Um, it's that, you know, we, all of us, you included the middle class is that we're white, right? So it, 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 it simultaneously levels them with this racial block or we're a man or we're male or, and, and it, and it, you know, and it says, listen, we're all to blame. We're all in that. We all share complicity with this thing. So it kind of covers the ball, but it also makes sense for them individually to adopt this. I know my own head of school, George Davison, went through a kind of a woke awakening um, because when your, um, you know, when your country club only started accepting Jews, uh, you know, a generation or two ago and blacks, you know, you know, as well, then and, and all of the people that's 
that are attending upon you in your Park Avenue mansion are people of color, okay, then the, the, the critical race vision of America actually fits for you. It actually makes sense because it describes your childhood and adolescent and, and, and reality. So there's a tendency, well, it, well, actually, we are a racist country in, in all of these ways. And guess what? Um, you know, it is for all white people. So that projection, I think, is and, and these are the people who actually decide um, in their board meetings, you know, whether to staff up in DEI, for example, uh, and the consultants will come in and, and do the dog and pony show and they'll fall for it and they'll fall for it because a lot of them, that's the, that was their parents reality or their grandparents reality. And then the moral culpability that they feel gets pushed outward. And I grew up in a you know, I grew up in a college town. But I went to a public school. Uh, I had friends of all different races. I, I, you know, in my 20s and 30s, same thing. And I didn't really, that wasn't my experience. It wasn't a lot of white people's experience. And so we're all being subjected to this sort of feverish projection of elite whites, in my view. That's part of it. Um, <clears throat> that reminds me of, of uh, the line in um, Radical Chic by Tom Wolfe, where he describes how these sort of uh, sort of wealthy Manhattanites who are throwing parties for the Black Panthers, they have this like difficulty in that uh, they need to make sure that the help for their parties is always white because yeah. otherwise uh, the the impression would be that they are participating in this racial hierarchy. Well, um, so that you know, I guess all things are, are new again. But so what you're describing is is like both a very deep discomfort with hierarchy and the existence of an elite um, and the kind of ruthless maintenance of an elite, which, which I, I suppose makes sense. I mean, nobody wants their children to take a step down in life. Right. But that's necessary, necessarily what any kind of actual genuine, genuinely serious leveling scheme, right. Um, mm -hmm. Would be. So I think, I think you make a really good point about, especially about transferring guilt to a broader section and, and especially, you know, I think we talk about this concept a lot in the opposite direction, where we talk about how um, the the systemic, for example, systemic nature of racism, the way that, like, say, it, it Ibram Kendi would would perceive it, uh, really removes agency from young Black Americans, right? And and um, has a negative effect. I mean, Ian Ian Rowe uh, wrote this this great book. He was on this podcast also talking about his book Agency, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That that it 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 does remove in in a very important way, um, a young person's sense that he is in, at least to some degree in charge of his own destiny. Um, but in this case, you're talking about it in almost the opposite way, where it's uh, now a, a particular sort of elite band of society can wield enormous, genuine privilege, wealth, and power. Mm -hmm. um, but can at the same time, even though they're part of the quote unquote oppressor categories, right? Um, that's a way of, of disengaging psychologically from your own role um, or, or your own actions, right? It's just, it's just this larger systemic force, right? That we're all participating in um, rather than, hey, you know, if you're really dedicated to this idea of leveling, well, then maybe you shouldn't be charging $54,000 a year to go to Grace Church School. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, they do have you know financial aid. Grace Church, to its credit, actually had more more financial aid than than any other of its peer schools. Um, but there's two things going on. One, I think, is that these are schools that their feature actually has become a bug, right? So the feature is that we're elites, okay, and we you come to us because we are elites. Like we will, we are the access for your child to get into. The halls of power right so that's a that's a huge selling point but that that very explicit you know or, or like lightly coded advantage that they offer that everybody knows they you know that they at least for now continue to offer uh or offer the appearance that they continue to offer it um which is kind of like offering it but um that you know that that but that now is a that now is something that you can be pilloried for right because as democracy turns into you know gets gets broader and broader then elitism is sort of the greatest sin so now they have to main they still structurally want to maintain their elitism but the marketing is terrible 
So they need to they need to cut, you know, put it under this uh, hide their light under a bushel basket of social justice uh, and diversity and all these other things. The other the other thing going on is that, you know, for most of the people that can pay this amount, pay the full ride, it doesn't matter whether their kid can 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 read Chaucer or, you know, understands the the themes of Dante's Inferno or whatever. So they don't they because their bread is buttered either way. Okay. So if they if if part of the compromise means lowering standards uh, of intellectual uh, competency and mastery of skills, they're okay with that, right? These are not the kids that are competing it at the SHSAT schools, like the the specialized high schools in New York, right? Where you actually you have to you have to be you know you have to have the skills. You've got to be like the immigrant kids that come in here and bust their ass actually do real, you know, need to be super smart and know how to do it and work hard. They're, they're going to be fine, right? This is, these are sort of patronage networks more or less. So, um, you know, that, that's also going on is that there's, there's also, it's like costly signaling of, of a species of animal, right? Like we can, we can, we're, we're going to be educated no matter what in the things that we need to know, which is power. So, you know, we don't need to insist that students um, have all of these great classical training skills. We can just, we can just, uh, you know, run under cover of the brand for as long as it'll carry us, uh, while we also get the benefit of this, um, you know, elite denying discourse around us. I guess how I would put it. Yeah, I mean, so I guess I have I have two observations and questions. To, to kind of um, volley back to you, the, the first is they they do need it, um, especially, and, and I think this is one of the things that you and I agree, I think, most strongly on. I, I think especially in a, a world in which one's meaning in life is not essentially uh, handed to you, right? Where you don't, we don't live in a world where we're not living in, in sort of the integralist middle ages um, where we are handed a faith and a place in society and a hierarchical society. And that's just our fate. And there are many negative things about that. Don't get me wrong. I actually am a small L liberal. Like I don't think that's the ideal way to organize society, but it seems to me that in uh, sort of post enlightenment and capitalist society, which has produced enormous amounts of prosperity unheard of um, in human history, that the, we are now facing the problem of atomization and meaning um, and, and especially when traditional religion seems out of reach to so many people, you know, look, I, I went to, so I went to a public high school, but it, it was, um, it was one of these like essentially public prep schools, right? It was right next door to Stanford, um, extremely mm. academically high achieving, right? Um, very, very, very high pressure environment. Um, and you know, the, the, the number of like, quote unquote, mental illnesses that people had, right? That their inability to, to cope um, with adversity um, was extremely high. And I think part of that is that lack of, and it, you know, that, that lack of a base that comes sometimes from religious practice, sometimes from community practice, sometimes from family, right? But if, if you kind of knock out one by one, those, those pillars underneath people, uh, oh yeah, don't get me wrong. Like I completely <laughs> agree with that. Like I, I, I'm commenting from the sort of cynical materialist perspective, but of course, like if you know, I'm looking at it from the perspective of uh, of the parent that works at Goldman Sachs and just is like, yeah, you know, just put your head down and you know you'll be fine. Um, but yeah, no, but in the level of really meaning, at the level of children, there. like yes, like we have it's a catastrophic decline in meaning. And to know, to understand and appreciate our traditions, um, and I use the R, the O-U-R broadly, um, is, is super important to understand what it means for you. And I think a lot of parents take that for granted by when they go along with this other stuff, which is kind of the air sets uh, morality that's substituting. So both from the materialist perspective and the perspective we've been talking about, I mean, how... At some level, the project, I feel like, well, let me back up one second. Let me ask you, do you think we are reaching some kind of tipping point? Obviously, it's becoming easier to express, at least in certain 
um, outlets and circles some kind of objection to what I would call a cultural revolution that's building. Um, on the other hand, it seems like the power of this ideology within those institutions is only growing stronger. Um, so where are you? Do you think we're at some kind of tipping point or do you think it's going to get worse from here? Not better. Um, I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a long, hard slog, um, decades long, hard slog because you, you know, you're right. There's a the little, the tiny little hole that only a few electrons shot through is now getting wider and there's, there's more, more freedom. There's sort of a glass nose to, you know, around, uh, perestroika, I, I get them confused, uh, around like what can be said and, and what is sort of tolerated and maybe, um, Twitter will be helpful with that. Um, but at the same time, all those people have still have jobs and they're still hiring. Right. So there is there is just tremendous momentum, structural and uh, institutional momentum around, you know, DEI philosophy. And it's ensconced. Right. You're not going to, you know, th and those people don't know how to code. OK, so you're not going to be able to pry them out with an oyster knife. Uh, and, you know, it, they're, they're going to work through the system and either, you know, who knows, like maybe an economic catastrophe would be the best thing to end wokeness because then, you know, maybe uh, these companies and schools will realize that like having a 259 DEI executive directors or, or direct managers is a bad thing. It's not sustainable. But I think that it's going, you know, all of the professors, all the teachers, all the young teachers coming to the ed schools, all the HR departments, you know, um, there, uh, that that's not going to go away. There are millions, tens of millions of people who are part of these industries, and you either need, you know, a Curtis Yarvinite, you know, monarch to come in and start, you know, swinging the axe, uh, or, or like you need, you just need a, which I don't think is necessarily a good idea, uh, but or you need a massive sort of cultural transformation. You need it in Hollywood. You need it. You need uh, a, a countercultural movement which isn't just a lot of podcasts and intellectuals. It's actually in, it's an artistic movement. Um, and I don't see a lot of signs of that in Hollywood. I don't see a lot of signs of that in television, a few green shoots, like in, in, a, you know, white Lotus is an interesting show I've been watching that kind of points to some potential. Um, so it's going to be a, it's going to be a big sea change. And I think that the PR, there, there have been a lot of PR wins um, in the public, but institutional wins I haven't seen yet. A few, yeah, that's, maybe. That's a really, really good way to put it. Um, I, I just talked actually the last episode of this podcast, which I do every month with Emily Jashinsky. We, we talked about the artistic angle to this. And I, I, actually, I actually am quite hopeful in the artistic space that there will be at least some kind of counter movements because, and by which I mean not explicitly political counter movements, but um, I do think that there's there has reached a point where it's extremely rote. And so even very talented art artists um, who have no interest in the political battles um, are kind of finding themselves just like in the Soviet Union, by the way, but kind of finding themselves at a crossroads where they have to sacrifice not just like to say the right things at the party or to write the DAI statement, but that their work itself, you know, has to conform with the equivalent of Soviet realism, right? And mm -hmm. that there's an artistic um, imposition that's now happening that I think is engendering a, a kind of artistic backlash because, you know, if, if you are um, an artist or somebody who wants to produce some art of value, uh, there has to be some respect, I think, ultimately for the, the control over your artistic project. Um, and the integrity of that project. And I think we have finally gotten, I mean, in some sense, it means it's gotten bad enough, right? Um, but but I do think there is some hope in that. But it seems to me if we're going to have any political hope of building our way out of this, um, it's got to be institutional, as you say. And it seems like in some cases, maybe this, so those institutions are salvageable. In a lot of cases, I think they're not, and we're going to have to build around them. So my question to you is, at what point are some of these 
people who maybe are quiet objectors to this, it seems to me there's not really a way around the fact like they are going to have to be willing to exit the elite pipeline. Right. And this, this is a big power. problem, right? So you have this prestige yeah. problem. You know, you can take a brand, let's say you take a luxury brand. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know fashion, but imagine, you know, so, and then basically that brand becomes corrupted from within. It starts it materials start to degrade, you know, the, the, it's just the stitching isn't that great in the handbag or whatever. And eventually like, it's just, it has this name though. And imagine that, but imagine there are no other competitors or all the other luxury brands are deteriorating at the same rate. And then the lower brands are deteriorating too. Right. So you have this condition where like, instead of, you know, a rise, a lowering tide is lowering, is lowering the quality of education all across the, the you know, the land. Um, now you're someone who has a lot of resources. Okay. And you're looking at this picture. Where do you, where do you send your child? Now we're not talking about handbags. We're talking about schools. So where would you send your child? Well, you're going in the absence of any prestige, high prestige alternatives, you're going to stick with, you know, the, the horse, which is, you know, aging poorly to mix a few metaphors, but like, you're going to, you're going to stick with the thing, which is deteriorating maybe at the same rate or even slightly faster, as long as it has the brand, the, the prestige attached. So you, you need to, you need to have this, this effort to create other institutions that are new, but have enough prestige attached so that they will attract enough new entrants who are scared, right? Because the scared money is always the ones with the most money in a sense, like, except for the few exceptions. So, you know, how do you do that? How do you, how do you rustle up enough, you know, brave, rich people to try to change what's going on um, in that world uh, when those people know exactly the costs of, of, you know, bucking the trend because, well, if I, if I send them to this school, which is, well, then maybe they're not going to get in anywhere else. And where, you know, am I going to, are they going to have to go to Hillsdale? I mean, really? That's, that's the mindset is like, I'm not, am I really going to have to send my child to a second, second tier school? Um, and it's, you know, in some ways it's, it's kind of comic and it's, and it's depressing. Um, but, you know, understand sympathy for the devil, understand that Brahmins throughout history have always Brahmined and that's what they do. And I want to, I don't, you know, I want to challenge people to speak up and be courageous and all the things, but I also am pretty clear eyed about incentives and you need to have the, in the incentives are more important than than courage in a way like you kind of need both but you know i'll take incentives over courage any day of the week <laughs> yeah i mean i i agree with that, that the incentive structure has to change but i i do think at some level it has to start with the courage of talented people right because there won't be any alternative built in the scenario that you're you know, referencing. And and there is a moral dimension to this that I, I this is why I've, I've started to find it disturbing, you know, um, and, and starting to verge into the contemptuous, I guess. And maybe I shouldn't be, I mean, maybe you should tell me that I shouldn't be, but you're, you're not just talking about whether or not your children will be able to go to, you know, to go to Yale or Harvard, the, the, the motto is Veritas, right? Still, as far as I know, right? Um, laughably, right? It's, it's not just that, you know, yes, your kid can go um, to Harvard and maybe you go work in Goldman Sachs. But like at this point, there's a non insignificant chance that your your daughter might be sterilized before she gets there. Right. Or or that, um, you know, that, that like that something else horrible because of this ideology will actually affect, um, you know, your child's identity, how he or she sees himself, her, him or herself, right? Like it's, it seems to me that it's the, 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 there is a moral imperative at some point, like better that my kid is whole and works as a firefighter than goes to Harvard and chops off her breasts, right? Like there has to be some level uh, of, of like, there has to be a bottom here, I guess is what I'm saying, that, that there has to be some level of courage to say, yes, 
it is better at some point um, to give up the prestige and hopefully become part of an institution like Hillsdale. I mean, Hillsdale standards have been able to be shooting up through the roof now. Right, because oh God, yeah. I mean, things. believe me, don't get me wrong. Like, yeah. I am not. I I am like putting my brain in the brain of the, you know, the elite, uh, you know, person. Um, but I would say absolutely, and that would mean an inversion of values and an inversion of shame, right? So it would be like, you know, instead of virtue signaling that, um, you know, we're so progressive, and you know, our child is is a. Uh, uh, you know, doing all these wonderful things for social justice and aren't we great? The inversion is actually, if you don't, if you push this on your kid, you're a bad parent. Like, I, I think you need to, like, social opprobrium needs to invert and we need to get to that place exactly what you're talking about, where it's a moral failing not to put your kid's mental health first and their physical health first, which would mean a status like chasing status would be, well, you know, at the exclusion of all else would kind of become anti-status. So that's what I, that's what I think, you know, that's the way I think. If you ask Paul Rossi, that's what I think. And, and there are many, many parents that think that, but not enough. Um, yeah, not, well, not right it's now. Exactly, it's exactly the kind of parents though, that, so like I, I, I said about Hillsdale, um, Hillsdale is so they have always had a, a world-class education. I mean, I, I'm jealous every time. So I, I, um, you know, every time I interact with Hillsdale students, I'm jealous mm -hmm. of the actual education that they received, but it's true that on sort of, um, you know, SAT scores or rankings, um, Hillsdale is not where Harvard is. Right. Um, it's by no means bad, but they're, they're able to accelerate their academic profile of their students and the talent of their student body exactly because they're still maintaining this academic standard that no one else is. Um, I think St. John's doesn't less explicitly, um, although I don't know, they might be captured at this point too, but for a long time, because it is built into the very school's sort of mission, mm -hmm. right? That they're going to be teaching the great books. Um, and so even if they, I'm sure they now add all this, you know, sort of ideological gloss on top of it, still fundamentally, if you're going to St. John's, right, you're reading, you're reading the great books of Western civilization. Um, and so I, I, that has allowed those institutions. Um, I know for sure about Hillsdale, I would guess St. John's. They are able to build a new sort, sort of prestige because now they're able to attract a student quality that they could not have done 10 or 15 years ago because those students would be going to Harvard. But now some small percentage of the students who would be going to Harvard are going to Hillsdale. And drop it. Nice. It, I, I like that. I mean, you're, you're dropping white pills and I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, <laughs> right, but, but that kind of project replicated everywhere in every institution, right? To make things that are genuinely worth according honors and prestige to and elite positions, genuine institutions mm -hmm. that are genuinely worth the, the prestige assigned to them that is going to require more and more people who could make it into Harvard to go to Hillsdale. It seems to me. Well, it needs to have, yeah, you need to get to the, you talk about a tipping point. You need the gold rush moment where people, where parents are going to be like, wow, you know, these people who went to these places, they're moving to the thing and they're actually getting hired and they're actually doing really well in their life because it's grounded. The prestige is actually grounded in quality. Right. And then, then it would be like, well, if I don't, if I don't apply here, I don't send my kid here, then I'm missing out. Then that's when you're going to see like the massive acceleration kick in. Um, rather than, then it being like, it's a quality alternative, which you should not overlook to crap. I'm going to be out competed if I don't, if we don't go here. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Um, which, which, I guess, which impulse do you think is going to save us? Because right now we're talking about the creation of a counter elite, essentially. Um, and you, you mentioned Yarvin. Um, like, because it seems to me that there are, there are sort of two ways this could go. Um, either one of them potentially not successful. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, but there's sort of, there is a small democratic backlash. In other words, the backlash of the many. Um against these ideas being imposed institutionally by mm -hmm. an elite. And so there's an anti-elitist backlash. And then there's, you know, the Yarvin case, which is 
you need to build a counter elite and work within the elite because there has always been, as you said, Brahmin's going to Brahmin, right? Like um, there's always been, I guess the cat, the, the, the corollary would be mm-hmm. Brahmin's going to Brahmin and Brahmin's always going to rule. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I'm not, I haven't, I haven't been ever convinced fully of that because it seems to me that America has always had a very, actually a very um, prosperous, educated uh, middle. So which, which mm-hmm. way do you think uh, this is? I think like both, think right? Valuable. So like, you know, the easy answer is both, but like there, yes, there's an, inc- there's a, there's a tremendous energy from people, you know, the, the, and I don't mean, I don't mean to just like, it is like the people at the school board meeting, right? With their, with their, um, with the pictures of the dirty books and saying, how the hell, what the hell is going on? Right. And they vote and they, you know, they're engaged. And the more people that get engaged like that, the better. Um, but they're, you know, I think the other side is also true is that people are busy and they're making busy, like living their lives. You know, the, the people who are going to um, be elected and actually make decisions in the smoke filled rooms, which, you know, will always sort of be there are going to be the people that can keep enough of those people happy and give them options. And so you have the school choice movement and everything. So like, it's almost like, yeah, you need both. You need to, the, if you push too far, if the elite pushes too far and there's a, there's a backlash, well then, okay, those people are an opportunity for other people to come in and kind of give them what they want just enough, you know, to keep, to keep them happy. So you're kind of the same time you're gerrymandering, you know, you're sort of gerrymandering discourse, you're gerrymandering, um, but there, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't, I actually, you know, there, there will be, the existence of democratic small d pushback and and you know to the extent that we have it and i think it's good as a is an educated populace doesn't subtract the the you know the universal necessity for some kind of elite now i don't mean that as like like a necessity like we'll die without them but that they're always going to be there um and that it's better to have an enlightened one than a than a than a corrupt one i mean they're always corrupt but but you want to limit the corruption um it's kind of how i would muddle through that question uh yeah i mean so i agree that there's always going to be some kind of elite um but i'm less so i guess i'm i'm less certain about how much power they're always going to have some power it's always going to be disproportionate perhaps their democratic proportion right um but, but the balance of those things matters a lot. And it seems to me that in the U.S., there actually has been an enormous amount of self-rule, right, of, of true self-government um, that has been bottom up. Uh, yeah, but I mean, again, you've got this problem since, night, since World War II. You have this tremendous bureaucracy around people whose – their goals in life are to, like, get credentialed and, and serve in the quarters of power eternally no matter who's president. Right. So you have you just there's just that's just the fact. And you can't fire this. I, I was thinking pre-World War II history. And, and yeah. I mean, like, I think the 19th century in the United States is in many ways um, a very. Like, actually, even the problems of that kind of rule tend to be like you develop sort of Tammany Hall type problems. Mm. Right. Where you have mm-hmm. the corruption of sort of the low. Um, yeah, it's kind of good corruption right? of um, of explicit political power. Um, in a corrupt way, but I, I've always thought that the sort of the ills of that are perhaps overblown and the ills of, of exactly the managerial or technocratic elite that we've had for the last 70 years or 50 years, depending on your, I feel like we underestimate the, the sort of ills of our current setup and overestimate in some ways the ills of, of sort of the just, just your Tammany Hall Oh, yeah. No, I mean, local corruption, there's a way to look at that where it's, you know, if it skirts the rules or whatever, as long as the patronage system is close to the ground and the, and it's granular and like the actual community members kind of benefit, that's, you know, in a way that's it's still corruption, but it's preferable to this nationalized corruption, uh, which is like severed from and exploit far more exploitative of um you know, the population, uh, the general population. I agree. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like the cartel, you know, is a dirty business and people get killed 
and it's horrible. Um, but then what all the people who, you know, all the people of, um, you know, the province of Mexico, where it's coming from, you know, they're, they're, they're fans, right? Why are they fans? Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I remember in 2007, actually, so I, I went to school in San Diego. So, uh, I remember in 2007 when they took out one of the major cartels, like finally the Mexican mm -hmm. government, you know, sort of got their act together. They took out one of the cartels and things got infinitely worse because all of the cartels mm -hmm. went to war with each other. That's when the real like bloody. Yeah. Chapo. Sort of, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Era happened on the border and it just it, it does seem to to really if, if nothing else it does seem to really uh i'm not i'm not proposing that as a solution to our problem <laughs> i mean i'm saying i mean and that's actually really bad because it's in the national level too like it's it's a it's the it's a narco state so like let's let's be yeah. real but I'm, I'm like to go back to your tammany hall example you know um there's a set of rules handed down on high there are people that cheat the rules at the local level there are there are opportunities for people. They become sort of local heroes, even though they're they're crooks. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot less bad than um, you know some kind of five thousand persons you know state agency that 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 exists in perpetuity. What? Why is our elite so homogenized now? Because as we're talking about this, I'm thinking about like you know you have. The bosses of Tammany Hall, and then even even like within New York, right? And I don't, I'm not I'm no expert on sort of New York history, but I do live near the Five Points, so. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Daniel have, Day have, Lewis coming around with a meat cleaver. Yeah, exactly. So white, yeah. <laughs> At least I die a true American. Um, <laughs> no, but you have these sort of. First of all, you have competing sort of bosses on the corrupt level, um, and then you have sort of uh, the Brahmins of of the upper. Um, I don't know, Upper West Side, Upper East Side, whatever, which choose, choose your ethnic group. Um, <laughs> but, but like, you know, so, so why is it that our elite is so homogenized now? And it's funny because exactly the same people that you, you know, were at your school are so concerned about sort of diversity. And I, here I'm not even saying diversity of thought, although I think diversity of thought throw, flows from this, but there's no diversity of sort of experience or trajectory or how people made their money so much anymore right in this elite it's very they all went to the same schools they all like had the same largely the same trajectory and yes you have different flavors of it you have a silicon valley flavor of it um which is still a little bit more wild westy and then you have like the, mm -hmm. the sort of east coast finance um flavor of it but Fundamentally, why have our elites have homogenized so much? Like, what? Where's our? Where's our? Like, um, because because I don't think SBX counts this, as, like our Tam Tammany Hall. You know? Yeah, there is like this. There is this sort of professional professionalism in the. You know, we talk about business schools and the institutionalization of corporate. What it means to have a corporation? Like, they all kind of look the same. Doesn't matter what business. It's just like almost like there's certain things you have to do to do it right. You have to do this business plan. You have to do all the things, and like it does homogenize um, experience. And and I like the I, that's that's what I think it is. I think it's sort of the almost the the Byzantine decadent, the decadence of Byzantium. Like you know, there's all of these different there, there there's all these diversity of things, but they all are basically kind of the same because everyone's supposed to just do things by the book. There's a book, in other words. Maybe that's you know. Yeah. Well, what, that's what's my very I mean, uneducated what's, take what's on in it? What's the book? Like, and more importantly, why? Why is there only one book now? Because it seems to me that even well, I think it's going to be predictable. Predi if you're unpredictable, no one's going to give you a dollar. But that that okay. But that's a general thing that was just as true a hundred years ago as it's true now, and it. I guess there's a more, I, I think the book is that there's a standard way to be predictable or there's perceived to be a standard way to be predictable rather than many different ways to be predictable. Well, well, maybe it's, maybe it's exactly, I mean, I, I'm not usually the person who sort of rants about globalization, but m maybe it, maybe it is in this case technological because the, the way to be predictable or the book in say, you know, Ohio versus New York versus California, even, even 50 years ago, um, it wasn't as frictionless, right? You had sort of regional mm -hmm. variations and even more so if you're talking about, for example, China versus the United States, right? But um, 
may, maybe it is the the instantaneousness of communication um continuous well, also the loss of tr like we're we we become atomized and with that you've lost uh, you've lost those regional cultural touchstones that allow say the folksy you know farmer to do business with a handshake right like that's kind of the that's the frictionless uh cultural that's the frictionlessness that you get with a with a sort of regional cultural uh you, the trust relationship when you have the same culture like and i think that um the regulatory environment and the complexities around that it's like your car right You're, you can't fix a car anymore you need a you need a person who's a computer geek to fix your car it's the same i think it's very similar um let me let me wrap up by by asking you this um what do you think people can and should do both inside and outside these kind of elite institutions you said courage is not enough um but what what sort of i mean if america is nothing if not civically organized right like there's a pothole on the street in america you know a week later there are five committees um and a, a blue ribbon panel to devise what happened in the pothole still to get fixed yeah by. yeah but, and i i believe in that i believe me like i yeah. that is where the that is where the hope is you know it's in the it's in that it's in the sort of the thing that the thing that prompts you to get to get and show up to the school board meeting and 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 read the dirty book you want that to be spanning time and go forward and get into other issues and to become a citizen again. So I think that there are these sort of great, great civic awakenings too, that can, that can draw more people into the process and then um, understand how the sausage is made and then they get elected and then they, um, you know, and I, I think there's a great, there's great hope there. Um, the, the great uh, fear there too is the, way organized political parties will capitalize on that and create their own patronage networks and exploit uh, outrage for fundraising. And, you know, you get a whole slew of people that are professional politicians in both parties that are going to glom onto that and, uh, you know, basically uh, turn that, you know, make whores of us all. Okay. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's the greatest opportunity, and it's but it's also like, you know, with you have to watch out. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a good warning to end on, both up uh, optimism and and warning to end on. Thank you so much, Paul Rossi, for coming on High Noon. Um, where can people find your work? What's your Twitter account? Um, I'm kind of um, yeah, I'm in, in various directions. I'm on Chalkboard Heresy. Um, uh, youtube.com slash chalkboard heresy uh and also on twitter you can find everything that i do on twitter paul d rossi on twitter thanks again for for coming on high noon paul i've really enjoyed this conversation thanks so much inez glad great to be here and thank you to our listeners high noon with inez stepman is a production of the independent women's forum um, we have other pot productions like at the bar which is uh a uh, podcast with me and my colleague Jennifer Braceras, uh, where we talk about issues at the intersection of law, politics, and culture. We also have She Thinks, which is hosted by Beverly Hallberg, which goes uh, through more of policy and political news of the day. Um, as always, you can send comments and questions about any of those things to Inez.Stepman at IWF.org. Please help us out by hitting us the subscribe button, leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or IWF.org. Be brave, and we'll see you next time on High Noon.